Good morning, campers, and welcome to Radio Camp Half-Blood, a Percy Jackson read-along podcast. I'm B, And I'm Zach. And this week, we read Chapter 17 of The Battle of the Labyrinth, The Lost God Speaks. What a depressing chapter this was. Yeah, it was a real bummer. <laughs> It was extremely a bummer. Talk about having, we're going to have a happy-go-lucky chapter and everything about this is, is, I don't want to exist anymore. Existence is pain. I want to die peacefully. I'm dead. This chapter was sort of like if the Lorax ended with the Lorax killing himself. That's sort of like what it was. Wait, that's not what happens to the Lorax and the Lorax? Wait, does he? He sort of shoots into space, doesn't he? He commits seppuku in a different fashion than we're normally accustomed to. Okay, so maybe it's closer to the Lorax than I realized. Because we're talking about the Lorax movie. All I know about it is, is people were thirsty for an animated 3D character. That's all Did I know about that. Did you see that tweet that was like, maybe we should have gotten something else out of um, the Lorax because we really are ruining the planet, but all people took from that movie was that the ones there was hot. <laughs> Yes, it's either that or Jack Frost and Rise of the Guardians. Yeah, what? Those weren't even good movies. But on a good positive note, B, I'm in my new recording booth. I'm in the official Radio Camp Half Blood booth. Yes, it's really nice. I moved into my new place. It's very roomy, except it's so hot, it's hotter than Hades up in here right now because we're having 110 degree weather and it sucks. Oh no. I'm kind of always worried you're going to sort of have a heat stroke situation while we're recording and you could sort of. Sense that as the recording goes on, you get a little bit more and more like um the character from uh, Avatar when he drinks the cactus oh, water. Sokka? And, yeah, when Sokka drinks the cactus juice and like loses his mind. That's sort of like where you start to escalate if we record for too long. No, it's more like for me, I'm like a firebender. I'll, I'll just start singing Leaves from the Vine eventually. It'd be really depressing. Yeah, I'm still not recording in a studio, just hoping that my neighbors don't decide to, like, mow their lawn or something. Um, Seems to be eerily quiet today, actually. B, if they're mowing your lawn, I will personally fly over there to fist fight, most likely, your neighbor. Or, yeah, or my mom's boyfriend sometimes. Oh, no, I'd take him out. We'll get some barbecue. I'll buy him some new Crocs with socks. It'll be great. (laughs) No, it's not Crocs. It's... Birkenstocks. Those are his go-to dorky shoe. Okay, B, whatever. Otherwise, I'll probably take him to, like, Oktoberfest and we'll get some later hosen. I'm sure he enjoys the polka. When you come here, it actually will be Oktoberfest, so. Oh, da, yeah. Uh, So this week we read Chapter 17, The God Speaks, and this chapter opens up as, you know, all happy good lucky chapters go. Annabeth is crying horribly. Is sobbing. She's sobbing and running. It's really sad. Like, the way that Percy describes it is just so upsetting because he's like, oh, yeah, by the way, she's been crying this whole time. Uh, This is what it says, B. Annabeth had been crying the entire time while we were running. We've been running. (laughs) Yeah. She now collapsed and put her head between her knees. Her sobs echoed through the tunnel. Nico and I just sat there staring at each other. He dropped his sword next to mine and he took a shaky breath. I like how he just says, well, that sucks. That sucked, he said, which I thought summed things up pretty well. Um, Yeah, so I just thought, like, the way that that was tacked on was really funny in a way, like, funny in a sad way, where you're like, oh, they're running away, and you realize that she's been, like, freaking out this whole time after she saw Luke, and this is sort of, it's really coming to a head, this whole weird tension between Percy and Annabeth and Luke, and then to a lesser extent, um, Rachel, sort of like this other figure that like Annabeth is acting out against because her stupid weird boyfriend is an evil titan basically (laughs) he's got glowing eyes he's got blonde golden hair what is this a twitter convention oh I I thought for a second you were about to um sing the Danny Phantom (laughs) oh I was gonna say that hey hey Luke was just 14 when his parents built a very strange machine He had he had white hair and glowing green eyes. He could walk through walls, walls disappear, and disappear and fly. Much more unique than the other guys. Other guy. Got to catch them all because he's Danny Phantom. Yeah, then he knew what he had to do. He had to stop all the ghosts <laughs> that were coming through. He's here to fight for me and you. For me and you. Yes. Why is that in there? Like, I don't remember the like, Pythagorean theorem, but I can remember that. I can remember that. Well, I can remember most uh, Nickelodeon things, as well as I can remember in the back of my head the entire theme song for Foster's Home for Imaginary Friends. Yeah, it's all in there. It's not useful, useful, but it is in there. Well, it was either that or me becoming a rocket scientist. I decided to pick the latter. 
Yeah, you just you went full SpongeBob and threw out all the important stuff and only kept like fun facts about horror movies. Fine dining and breathing. <sighs> Fine dining and breathing. <laughs> yes, uh, but exactly. I like the situation they have here because everything comes to the boiling point where Annabeth. She's in denial in a much more interesting, more natural way than you would think. Denial ain't just a river in Egypt, and this girl is in it, because it's the worst. It's funny, because like she's crying and stuff, and my first instinct is always, I always think about Airplane when the girl's having a hysteria attack, and the people start slapping her, and they're just having like a line of people. Yeah, I kind of feel like Annabeth needs a slap in this chapter. I didn't feel that much empathy towards her. I was kind of frustrated. Like, I relate a lot more to Percy being like, why do you keep defending him? I get that she feels a sense of connection to him through, like, all the stuff that they had gone through before, before he, like, became this evil jerk that he is now. But he is an evil jerk. He's been an evil jerk for several books now. It just is, like, very frustrating to see Annabeth act so attached to him still. It's weird because Annabeth has, like, this weird, like, loyalty. What's the old saying? Like, fool me once, shame on you type of situation. Yeah. Where she keeps doing it. She's on, what is it? By this time, it's probably the 68th time. Like, man, I, maybe I'm just really gullible. But it's weird because the look of the past isn't the look of the future. There's no such thing as, like, the inherent good. Yeah. They're, like, not the same person, practically. And even if there is a glimmer of that person, he still needs to be held accountable, sort of. And that's, like, what's really frustrating is, like, I feel like sometimes the narrative is trying to make it more complicated. Like, oh, well, he used to be a good person and Annabeth knew that person and that's why she feels this way and blah, blah, blah. But, like, he's not anymore and he's done a lot of really horrible things. And I think, to some extent, she has, like, this weird, like, ab abusive, apologetic thing going on with her where she's like oh yeah he it doesn't matter the stuff that he did because he i liked him back then and that's like really messed up oh all he does all day is slap me and beat me and tell how horrible i am but i love him anyways they're all everyone has their flaws yeah exactly yeah it's like it's Stockholm weird because she feels like it's, no it's not it's like battered housewife syndrome i believe it's yeah. called it's like something like that yeah it's like a i mean obviously it's not really her fault necessarily because i understand well, it's that Luke's there's fault. like yeah, it's Luke's fault. She's been manipulated in this way like that. I mean, he literally used her and the connection the she has with her to hold up, like, exactly, to, you know, pull a one-two punch and then hold up the sky like Atlas. And, like, that was a while ago that he did that. You would think that would be the deal breaker, right? There were there were several deal, deal breakers along the way. But it's like, what is that, that quote from, I think it's Bojack Horseman, where it's like, when you uh, wear rose-colored glasses, all the red flags just look like flags. <laughs> It's interesting in this book series, especially in YA as a whole with this whole situation, mm -hmm. because you never see it where it's kids feeling like they're being abused in this way, where they think the bad guy's the good guy and they keep coming back. That's something that doesn't happen in kids' books. This is a very... Like, there's a very black and white, like, good versus evil kind of thing, but... It's yeah, not even, I... like, with the good versus evil, because every time Annabeth sees Luke, she always wants to always go at his side, even though all these horrible things he's done, he's almost killed her several times. And it, it's hard to, like, imagine, like, in the situation, would we be this way? I don't think I'd be this way. I'm very much not that kind of person, so I think that's why I find it very hard to relate to Annabeth. I think personality-wise, she's very, like, loyal to a fault, and she has a hard time adjusting to change and has all these sorts of, like, weird hang-ups where if she, like, bonds with someone, then, like, that's her idea of that person and she can't change. Kind of even similar to, like, the way she sees Rachel Elizabeth Dare, she was jealous from the start, and it's taken a long time for her to even adjust to the fact that Rachel is helping them. Like, her opinions of people don't change very easily. She, like, sort of establishes um, an impression, and then it it's sort of stagnant, and I don't understand that about her. I find that very frustrating, because I, I can imagine being in a situation where someone obviously, like, isn't an evil old titan or whatever, but, you know, did something horrible or treated my friends horribly, and I don't, I can't imagine still sticking by that person. It's hard because when it comes to Luke, if he were to even have a redemption arc, he'd have to pretty much self-sacrifice himself for it to even matter at yeah, this there's, point. There, yeah, exactly. Like, the, the redemption arc... I don't know. I, I guess in some ways I'm thinking of about even like our culture right now and questions about like people who have done bad things and like should you forgive them and like how long should they wait before they're like allowed to, to be exist, forgiven to be forgiven. Exactly. And like the difference between like accountability and just sort of like superficially apologizing and that kind of thing. And I, I feel like there would be so much that would have to be 
done with Luke's character for him to be redeemed. Because the only reason that Annabeth believes in him is because she's not seeing him for who he is, but for who he was. And it's hard because you have the Kylo Ren situation where you can't really redeem Kylo Ren because, one, he killed his dad, and two, he's a ding-dong, like he's an idiot, so he either has to die or do something so stupidly good, like save a bunch of burning orphans out of a super orphanage. It's it's not like one good thing also counteracts a bunch no. of bad things too. Like you would also he would also have to understand what he has done wrong, and I don't get that sense from Luke. The problem though is I'm sure people are gonna talk about this with us is that Luke is a sociopath and he is one of those people like he doesn't care what people think about him. So how can you have the good or bad? It's like the weird morally gray area where okay, devil's advocate time here is even if I want to believe that okay. Annabeth loves Luke, and she's always had this love for him. It's still not healthy, no matter which way you cut it. Yeah, because he's done all these terrible things, and the only way for him to actually even be redeemed is to die. And that's not even like a. It's not even like a really like a spoiler. Yeah, that's kind of it. That's the only option he has for him. Yeah. No, I understand what you're saying. It's like there's no way to write him out of this hole because it's not because there are bad characters who are not even dissimilar from Luke let's say someone like Malfoy or something from Harry Potter who like do bad things but you get more of a sense like they're a victim of like gaslighting and manipulation on their own part and they're like subject to being led down a path when they're too young to understand what they're doing luke at this point how old is he now like 17 or something he also came to this conclusion by himself it wasn't a parent no exactly he's the one who like set all these things in motion he wasn't sort of like swept up by a charismatic evil figure it's not like chronos reached out to him first it was his idea to do all this stuff because he wanted to get back at the gods like he had all of these vindictive things and fan in his head already and Kronos was a means to that end so I don't feel bad for him necessarily I don't feel like he was manipulated or led down the wrong path or that you know he deserves a second chance he that's not how he feels to me as a character it's like he was you know darned from the start he was that was a part of his personality that he was vengeful most likely what happened when Luke was a little boy he got hit in the head by something and it's like to send him back at this point yeah, he, he's he pretty just, much is like the weird holy trifecta, or is it the the unholy triad? Where even like with yeah. serial killers, the first thing before they even start killing people is to start fantasizing about it. Luke has already pretty much has done that, and he's already committed so many. I'm, I'm gonna take a guess, like a stab atrocities. that. Well, atrocities, yes. I'm sure he's killed people before, and it, it's hard to like even justify. Like you can't, you can't have a character like. There's no. I guess the best way to put it is you can't go home again. Sometimes, like you can go back to your childhood home. But now all of a sudden it's a Denny's. It's like, well, (laughs) why did it become a Denny's? Well, the eggs were good. Things change. Yeah, things change. And it's hard because even with like, Percy does bring this up. It's like, why do you keep defending him? But our good friend Interruptus comes back with Rachel and we don't get the whole conclusion of this. Of course. And she's like freaked out. And then, of course, Annabeth is like sort of a um, doubly frustrating character in this chapter because she's both really mean to Percy about having the valid criticism of like, why do you defend Luke? And she's like, oh, well, you don't know him. It's like, yeah, he knows him now, not then. That's what matters is his actions now. It doesn't matter if he used to be whatever, a good person. You could be like, oh, yeah, Hitler was real nice when he was a kid. Like, people change. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, it's not, that's completely irrelevant to the conversation. See, that Adolf Hitler, he was a good painter, but, you know, he got that one rejection and everything just went downhill. Yeah, there. except for that one big problem about him. Yeah, there's that one big problem. It's, that's not how it works. No. And it's interesting even to bring this topic up because we'll probably move forward in this chapter. But uh, this week I actually had this weird uh, thought. That's what is mm-hmm. pretty much this weird sense of with Luke and Percy and everyone, this weird sense of like almost nationalism with their parents. And it comes with actually it comes more with oh, Grover yeah. and how everyone is pretty much like I, I love my parents, I have to support them no matter what they do. I guess when we get to Grover, I'll talk about it a little more. But I just watched the trailer for the new movie, uh, Jojo Rabbit. I think it's called the Taika Waititi movie where that's the kid. He's a Nazi youth and his imaginary friend is Hitler. Yeah. And it's it's funny because that the movie's pretty much that's like the idea of blind nationalism when his mom brings, um, she's been hiding like a Jew in her house. And like he gets like indoctrinated, basically. That's like the idea. Yeah. And it, it's interesting, like to even look at that, like the idea of like indoctrination, even in Percy Jackson. 
and how you can have like characters. their loyalty. Yeah. yeah, like even look at Percy. Like he is loyal to his father, even though his father isn't a good guy. He, he loves doesn't even his really father. know him that well. Yeah, but he's still. Matter. I'm a son of Poseidon. I love being a son of Poseidon. Yeah, that. I mean, that's the thing is, I don't even want to necessarily say that they're like quote unquote the good guys. Who is he, who does he talk to? I think it was Calypso who sort of talked about the idea of like the blind loyalty people have to their parents, and like it's not really based on anything. But I don't think that the logical solution to that is Luke's position, which is like, oh, I'm not blindly loyal to my dad, who's a god. I'm blindly, I'm blindly loyal, loyal to, Kronos. to Kronos. It's the same thing. Like that's like they're. They're doing the same thing and in a more horrifying way, honestly, in what Luke is doing. Even with Grover, like when we get to Pan, the horribly depressing thing, when you have blind nationalism, you cause Pan, he's like, he's pretty much in purgatory because no one's letting him go. He wants yeah. to go, but because you have these people that are like blindly following quintessentially a dead religion and the god just doesn't want to live anymore. It, it's interesting. Yeah, well, I think a lot of the chapter, especially once we meet Pan is about how a lot of people try to, like, have these specific ideals and they expect a sort of savior, like this one figure who will help them get their, like, achieve their goals. And, like, the whole lesson that we get from this chapter and what Pan says is, like, I can't help you. You're clinging to me as an ideal that I'll come in and fix all your problems. But really, your problems can only be solved by yourself. Yes, and also it's the idea of letting go of the past because once you let go of the past, the future becomes more brighter. Yeah, I... I they're like clinging to the idea of Pan and that, oh, if only he was there. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of basically the, the gist of it. I, I feel like we're, that's, that's a topic for a little later on in this, in yeah. this book. So, you know, Annabeth's kind of crying. Rachel's just like, oh, my God, this is terrible. Nico's like, everything's terrible. Life is meaningless. I got to listen to MCR right now. I got to yeah. detox. Full, full emo. Though I love how they, they have like this really big emotional beat and then they cut back to comedy. A good thing that Rick Riordan does is there's like a bunch of a huge heavy moment and then there's the comedy because Percy Jackson starts complimenting Rachel and like I nodded looking at Rachel with respect you hit the Lord of the Titans in the eye with a plastic with a hairbrush. hairbrush it's great and it's funny because you think about it because the last time he's like ow that hurts oh why'd you do that yeah I can't even understand exactly why that even affected him but it is a very funny slapstick moment I like Rachel a lot honestly she's good comedic relief in some way or like she's almost like a voice of reason because they're all so like entrenched in this crazy lore of the greek gods and everything and she's m more of an outsider so she's like what the heck is going on you guys are being real weird like she kind of has more perspective and i like that when you have characters like that where they're coming in from a fresh perspective because uh, a problem that always occurs in books actually a good example of this is um in Star Wars, where you, you need to have the character like a protagonist that knows nothing so yeah. it can be explained to the audience where Rachel's coming in with like a fresh perspective. And yeah. it's interesting to see that situation of like, wait, you're seeing all these weird things, like these weird abusive things with Annabeth. You see these things with Percy and she's the one that kind of finally starts pointing things out. Well, yeah, then then she says, will you two knock it off? And Annabeth says, stay out of it, mortal girl, if it wasn't for you, dot, dot, dot. And it's like, what do you mean if it wasn't for you? All she's done has been helpful. She literally hasn't done one negative thing throughout the entire time that Annabeth has known her. She's been a girl and existed next to Percy. That's probably her biggest crime in Annabeth's eyes. But other than that, like, she's only done really helpful things, led them through the labyrinth with her amazing ability to navigate. Like, she's hit Kronos in the head with a hairbrush as, like, a distraction, was able to help them get out with the help of Nico. Like, there's a lot of ways in which she's helped them, and really, the only reason that Annabeth doesn't like her is because she's mortal, and because she, like, feels like she couldn't understand, like, oh, you don't get why I'm still obsessed with this abusive demigod guy. It's like, no one can understand, because that's messed up. <laughs> it's interesting because you have a character like Annabeth where, in the past, she's been Cyclops racist. And now she's she prejudiced in a different way. It's actually interesting to have a character like this that is so inherently like prejudiced in certain like every book, she's prejudiced about something. Like she has Cyclops prejudice. She doesn't like her parents and her stepmom, even though they're totally normal people. We we've talked about this to death. And now you have Rachel Elizabeth Dare doing the exact same thing. Yeah. I think she's averse to change, I I guess. That's kind of a lot of what her personality is. But that's weird because she wants to be an architect. And she has to make change. Yeah, she wants to build things. Yeah, it's kind of, like, contradictory. But I, I guess just in her, like, personal lives, she, like, 
I don't know. You could like really psychoanalyze her and think about like, oh, when she was younger and she was wandering around with Luke and um, Talia, she like trauma bonded with them. And so like she craves stability maybe or something like that. And I think she feels threatened by people who are different than her in a lot of ways or people who like challenge the way that she thinks. Or maybe I think she doesn't like when things out of the norm start to occur. Like Percy kind of starts talking to Rachel and like, hey, this was our thing that we had. Oh, Oh, you're going to have Tyson here? Oh, I, I don't like Tyson all that much because of this reason. Yeah, she feels threatened by change and by other people, which is so weird because it's like, if anything... And there's nothing wrong with that quintessentially unless it's a very, like, a toxic type of situation, which Annabeth is, like, exhibiting all these weird things. She's a great character, don't get me wrong. Like, we're not Annabeth bashing, but when you break her down, this is what makes her a very interesting, in-depth character. Yeah. It's because she has, she has all trauma. these flaws. <laughs> Well, she does, and that's a great thing about Annabeth is she has all these flaws, but can you say the same thing about Hermione? Can you say the same thing about Katniss Everdeen? Like, mm, well, Yeah, you can say the same thing about Katniss, for sure. She, they're actually more comparable as characters, I would say, but um, it's hard to, yeah, the whole, like, comparing strong female protagonist things, like, they're all different in some ways, they're similar in others. I think, for whatever reason, like, the Hermione character was, like, pure blood and then had, like, weird, like muggle racism that would be sort of comparable it's sort of a combination of Hermione and like Ron in early books where he's like like very desensitized to like house elf stuff and that kind of thing it's like a similar like she's so entrenched in like the half-blood things that like sometimes she doesn't really have perspective about how like messed up her perspective is like she thinks that you know mortals are so different from her and that cyclopses are so different from her like she's very close-minded and she's very off set to in other her ways people yeah i i think that might have to do with also that she um like has lived at camp for so long like the, the whole culture of camp half-blood and being a half-blood has a lot to do with her identity and that comes back to the idea of like nationalism where you have people that get so hyped up about a certain way of living or a certain style and with camp half-blood nothing ever changes there because it's like this weird you know it's the camp yeah, environment it's like a bubble, and literally about when you think about camp, you always think about like that weird, rustic, timeless feel to it. And even even during the winter, it's pretty much the exact same place because Dionysus makes it that way to yeah. an extent. And I like that about Annabeth is that she's so flawed, but that's what makes her so unique. Because she's not like one of those... I, I always hate the fantasy trip of having the girls like, oh, I'm not like all the other girls. You know, I play with knives and I wear pants and stuff. She's not like that at all. Yeah, but she has she has a complicated personality. Yeah, like she's strong and she can do a lot of amazing things, but she also has a lot of flaws to her. Like I don't hate Annabeth. She's very frustrating sometimes, especially in moments like this, because you can tell like in some ways the reason it's frustrating is because you know she's sort of quote unquote smarter than this. You're like, why are you acting this way? You're supposed to be the logical one, the one who thinks things out. But then her like sort of fatal flaw a lot of times is thinking that she always knows best and that she can't sort of broaden her mind into like a different perspective. Like, oh, maybe, you know, I'm set in my ways and I thought that Luke was a good person, but things have changed since then. Or like, maybe I'm judging this mortal too harshly and actually she's helped out me and my friends a lot and I shouldn't be so weird and jealous. Like that's kind of her main issue it's interesting because you have the idea of you know being smart but also it i guess it's the joke of like you can be book smart or street smart yeah but you you can be smart but have zero common sense or be dumb but have a lot of common sense yeah that's sort of annabeth i think she sometimes lacks um like emotional intelligence i guess or maybe even like understanding of how other people feel because when you think of like monsters like Tyson. Yeah, empathy maybe. She likes a little bit of empathy. Oh my God, she might be with, with Luke on this one. Oh no. I, yeah, I don't think she's like a sociopath, but sort of like I think a lot of times she like lives in a world where her personal associations with something is the end all be all of it. You know what I mean? Like the reason she thought Tyson was bad because he was a Cyclops is because of her bad experience with a Cyclops. And it's like, just because you had a bad experience with a Cyclops doesn't mean that's the universal experience. You know not what I mean? Not all Cyclopses She's are like that at all. Yeah, no, it's... Even even with, like, Annabeth, or even a better example of this right now is Percy. Percy comes from a world where he didn't know his dad. He, he lived as a mortal for most of his life. And only, like, really fastly did he get thrown into this world. And he's developed a different type of understanding because he already came from a world where, like, his stepdad was a terrible person. 
and he wanted to protect his mom, but also he moved from place to place and got a different perspective. Whereas Annabeth, she left when she was young. She pretty much was like hobo tracking with uh, two delinquents for most of her life. And that's where she like, I, almost like a punk rock like type of mentality where I have to do everything my way. And if you don't like it, there's the road. And then she yeah. gets to the camp, which is more like a more stable environment. But you have this weird thing now where it's stable, but it's it's almost stable in like a cult like environment where you start to believe these you new have ideals. To like fall in line to like yes. the, the common mindset there, I guess. Yeah, because I mean, like we said last episode about how some of Luke's thoughts and sort of causes are. Valid. I understand why he feels that way about the gods. Sometimes they're really unfair. Sometimes they're really messed up. Annabeth relates to that to some extent, and that might have a lot to do with the empathy she has towards Luke. I mean, most of it, I think, has to do with her specific past with him. But, I mean, even Percy understood the way he felt, especially in the, the first book when he was so new to all of the demigod stuff and he felt so betrayed by his dad and all of that. Like, there's valid criticism to be had about the culture of... Camp Half Blood, and there's valid criticism about how Luke is reacting to it because both are kind of messed up in their own way. It brings an interesting idea as well with this is uh, like this weird thing. I'm I'm not sure if Rick Riordan is doing this intentionally, but the, it's like the tackling of like what is tradition versus what is practical because you have tradition, which is pretty much it's just ancient peer pressure is what tradition is, and then you have like Luke coming in and starting to question all these things, and the first response is, "Yeah, you're an idiot. Leave." You dumb, dumb boy. Yeah, there's sort of a middle ground. <laughs> yeah, there is a middle ground. Like, you can have tradition, but it's like, where? how far does it go? Because At a certain Percy. point, maybe tradition isn't helpful or isn't healthy. <laughs> well, sometimes tradition can be wrong. Like, it's weird to say that, but there's sometimes where, like, you can fall in line, like, throwing yourself into a volcano to appease your volcano god. Yeah. Tradition, does it help? It, it Possibly. I'm, I'm not going to tell if you're right or wrong if... Any person that lives on an island listening to our podcast that throws people in the volcano is good for you. Makes you happy. I mean, it's pretty culty when you think about Camp Half-Blood, too. Like, they literally, like, sacrifice some of their food to these yes. gods that they never see. Like, that's really messed up. And some up. of them don't even claim them. Like, if you look at, like, Ethan Nakamura, like, they don't even give two craps about them. And then they, like, still dedicate themselves to these gods that don't really care about them. I mean, we're sounding like Luke because it's true. He made some valid points. He went about it all the wrong way, sort of. He was very Machiavellian in his sort of ends justify the means belief. He's more like a cape-wearing, mustache twirling at times. Where... Yeah, it's so I, I understand where he's coming from, but it's, it's kind of interesting because, like, Annabeth excuses Luke despite the fact that he's sort of the polar opposite of what she thinks, and then she's also sort of indoctrinated into all of this camp half-blood stuff where she's really hateful towards mortals, too, because she feels like they're different from them and, like, doesn't trust them and is like, oh, well, I only believe what the gods say and all of that. See, that goes back to the cult environment where in a lot of cults you're not allowed to leave, and if you're, you're not supposed to talk to anyone from the outside. Yeah. You're supposed to pretty much be in your big old happy Manson family. And those are the only family that you need. And it's weird to it's, say it's it like that. It's a whole mess of a situation. <laughs> Annabeth is like maybe the worst in this chapter that she's been. She, she's like the, the peak of all of the the things that I've find, found frustrating about her character, which is like, I want to like her character. She's done so many cool, awesome things. And then like she has certain specific triggers that make her just act really irrational. And it may, it's... I'm like, just like, ah, don't you know better than this? I, th I thought you knew better than this. All you want to do is like just grab her and like shake her until she gets her senses back. She's just a gigantic bobblehead at this point. Yeah, it's it's really frustrating. I, I relate a lot to, to how Percy feels. I think I could like not really like the, the, the sense of, you know, being close to someone who, you know, is sort of still defending someone who isn't good for them. And that's like a really frustrating place to be in. And I think that's a great, like, message because it shows, like, different types of perspectives, especially to kids. Like, you might be, like, fanatical about something, but is it healthy or is it not? If You might like a person, but if they do something hurtful, then they do something hurtful. They're not, like, exempt from criticism. No, no. It's not like we're going to be having, like, Luke's going to have his Nuremberg trial. We're not going to have that. Yeah, I hope he... I honestly wish that that was the case, like, <laughs> in some ways that he was, like, held accountable in that way. But I, I feel like more he's just going to die. But same idea. But you you know in your heart of hearts, if he were to die, it's going to have to be something that has to redeem him or some some type of way 
Like, he's going to either destroy himself to destroy Kronos. Like, he's going to save the world at the end. But it, he has to go with it because it's like there's it's not redeemable at this point, in my opinion. I'm sure there are tons of people who really, like, stan him and are just, like, really mad that we're saying this. But, like, that's how I feel about the character. He's a mess. Well, no, I totally agree with you. And I think uh, everyone has their right to their own opinions if we're right, if we're wrong. It's just we're just two friends on the microphone. <laughs> yeah, they're right yes. to their wrong opinions about Luke. <laughs> Isn't that right, Dr. Frankenfurter? Even with this chapter, I think it's very justifiable that Annabeth is uh, broken because you are at the breaking point of this book where everything's lost. They've lost Daedalus. The pan's going to be dying. Uh, Annabeth this is, is pretty much crying. This is find out that pan's going to be dying, too. Yes. And this is where, again, this is the lowest point in your book. This is, in plot structure, if you're using the monomyth, this is where everything has failed. Like, this is literally a god has died. Like, what is more powerful than a god in this universe, B? Is there anything? Nothing, basically, right? Because are they even more powerful than titans? I guess I don't exactly know how that works. You're in theory, you're not supposed to be able to kill a god. That's kind of the thing they're tackling with Cronus. They can fade is, away, though. Yes, and I don't think Cronus is going to do the exact same thing. You know what? Maybe this is stupid. Bye, everybody. Guess you guys don't need time anymore. <laughs> Going on a little bit is kind of if we were to break this down a little quicker is. Uh, they keep stumbling through the maze until they find <gasps> Grover's Rasta cap. Yeah, yeah. This was bound to happen. I was kind of dumb last episode and couldn't remember who the lost god was. Then I was like, oh, of course, it's Pan. It's been a minute since we thought about him. But he's here. We found him. Finally. Yes. And I like how it's pretty much like big old like Carlsbad caverns. There's just stalactites and stalagmites. Oh, yeah. So I liked that um, explanation of how that happened. So like he... Um, so where, where's Carlsbad Cabins again? Uh, in New Mexico. New Mexico. So they, they were in New Mexico in the book when uh, Grover had that one specific moment of him like passing out and sensing Pan's presence, sort of. So that's how it happened is it was like an underground cavern thing near them that where Pan was dwelling. Fun fact, if you've ever watched the movie Atlantis, uh, all the slagmites and slagtites are based off of the ones in Carlsbad. Oh, that's interesting. When they were uh, doing photography, they accidentally went the wrong way and got lost for a little bit. So we could have had oh, a no. bunch of dead animators and <laughs> the photography would have been lost. I'm glad they were lost. okay. That we know of. That we know. There's some still in there and they're with Pan. Yes. Or they, they st stumbled into the labyrinth. Hey, what's up, everybody? We should make a Percy Jackson series now. So, yeah, this is... um. When it really gets depressing in this chapter, they do finally meet Pan, and I sort of was like expecting a kind of like more sweet or maybe not exuberant, but positive interaction with him, where it was like going to be about, you know, Grover taking up the mantle of taking care of nature, which is sort of what happens, but it's so much more depressing because it's Pan be basically being like, oh yeah, you found me, I'm alive, but barely, and I'm going to die now. <laughs> Give me something for the pain and let me die. Yeah, that's basically the move that he Get me he does. my breastplate um, stretcher. He's basically begging to die. It's really sad because he says something to the effect of like, oh, I've been in like a twilight sleep. I've been sleeping for a long time and then waking up for a short time. And then it, the, the times that I've been awake are shorter and shorter. And the only reason I'm around still is because all of the satyrs still vehemently like worship me and believe in me and like are prolonging a death that should have happened a long time ago kind of thing. Like it's just really messed up. And when you break it down, the core aspect of this, if I was to give an idea of what Rick Ryden's trying to get at here, is it's okay to let the past die at times because there's no more wild places, but there's always going to be that group of people. I'll give a good example of this. Flat Earthers. Hey, the world's flat. No, we're, we're so stubborn. We have to believe this. We're going to build rockets to disprove it, even though they believe that the Mars is round because they can actually see it, which oh is weird God. to me. And also Listen, are... I don't I don't know. <laughs> I think the interesting thing about Pan is like he's not saying that his cause is useless, but he's he's basically well, no, like his purpose is dead. His, his purpose is that they see him as a savior and that he's going to be the one to fix all their problems. And I mean, this is sort of like where it takes the environmentalist tilt and they're like, OK, well, the world is dying and there aren't a lot of like natural the world places is changing, left. And, don't you mean, B? I mean, it's it, literally like he has a dodo bird near him. So it's like sort of a real admonishment of humans and the way that they've like destroyed whole species of animals and that kind of thing. Like it's pretty heavy handed all the environmentalism stuff here's the thought that i had while i was reading this is you know our earth is you know all the wilds are in theory gone 
What yeah. if we decided to actually have a like, colonization? Would the gods follow the, like oh, to different that's planets? Interesting. Like, yeah, wouldn't that, I don't know. Wouldn't that bring Pan back? Because that means the wilds are back. The wilds are back. Or would it be a completely different god? Like, there's different gods for every planet. Like, I don't know how that works. Because the gods seem to be sort of based in in the Earth. You know what I mean? Yeah, and it's something that you could, like, explore. I think, if I remember correctly, I haven't read the book yet, but there actually is one of those in the Rick Ryden Presents. It's called, I think, Something Dragon. People will probably know what I'm already talking mm-hmm. about, where it's actually a whole book series set in space. Aren't you so excited to be for when Rick Ryden writes about Scientology and Xenu? Oh, geez. I mean, that would be a fascinating take, wouldn't you think? But yeah, like, I guess there would be different gods because unlike sort of, say, like, um, the Judeo-Christian god where, like, the idea of heaven is sort of, like, existing outside of Earth, a lot of, like, the Greek gods are, like, sort of based in mystical extensions of reality yes. like mount olympus used to be a mountain and now it's the top of the empire state building and like pan is inside of carlsbad caverns like there's a lot of like physical manifestations of gods in this here's the thing though this is the most fascinating part about this is the idea of you know uh western civilization the gods will always move where the civilization is the brightest right that's so true if they have like a colony in mars would they move there Oh, man, I don't know. <laughs> but wouldn't that be, like, weird because, you know, Ma- wouldn't Aries have the most power there? Because it's Mars. Because it's Mars. Yeah. Oh, man, I have... This is... I bet there's a fanfic out there, <laughs> honestly, because what a concept. This is... I said, I said B, this episode was going to get weird before we started recording. It's I'm going to say cerebral. something really weird. Just go with it. And I'm happy that you think I'm... No, cr- I mean, like, that's, like, kind of an interesting question to ask. I didn't even really think of that. I was just sort of, like... I'm interested to see what other people think about this. Have you ever thought about this? I feel like this is a question that hasn't been explored, even like religious or not. Yeah. Or I don't even know if Rick Riordan thought of like the logical extension of like the world building he did where he was like, oh, yeah, it follows Western civilization. Therefore, if they like what if it was like Wally and they were on a spaceship would the gods go to the spaceship, like there's a lot of like weird questions. Like that. So would they become the personification of what people the image of people are? So pretty much to be fat blobs just sitting oh, there no. like in Wally. Yeah, you were in my image. Yeah, I have no idea. That's like really weird to question. It's. I don't know. I think in the weird thing about this chapter is it kind of is pessimistic about like environmentalism and the world is sort of spiraling towards doom because of humans. But it's also somewhat optimistic because they sort of it's a it's a very Captain Planet sort of message where it's like, oh, it's the powers in you to make a difference. I think all the environmental messages you have to keep in mind when this book was specifically written, the time it's in where. We're at the point of where, can we fix anything? Can we not? We're in a point now where, yeah, we can fix things, but we have to do it, like, right now. Yeah, and more of an infrastructure change. That's kind of... I understand what you're saying. Like, I think the brand of environmentalism that's in this chapter feels very much like what we're still doing, which is the specific, like, you are making individual choices to help the planet. You're, you know recycling and consuming less and trying to reuse things and all of that kind of personal decision making which is sort of like the gist of what pan says to some extent but also obviously like the way that humans as a whole exist is like very bad for the environment and it even if every human on the planet decided to recycle that wouldn't change the fact that like a bunch of you know businesses cause a lot of destruction to the environment that are out of the control of each any one specific person so it's kind of like i could see how this was like more of like the approach to environmentalism that became popular maybe in the last 10 20 years and we're maybe moving away from that and hopefully more towards like a infrastructure change thing we've gone from pointing the finger at ourselves to pointing the finger at the the main source of the problems yeah yeah i mean it can both coexist for sure but it's kind of i that was like a very popular message in a way of like do your part you know it was the ted turner approach of just having the power is yours even like the toxic avenger a very violent movie where a kid gets his head crushed they made a whole environmental cartoon based off of it for kids yeah and it's it's all about you know like go to your local park and pick up litter and whatever and like that as if that's i mean that's not bad necessarily but it's sort of a 
a misconception that you could do that and therefore like the polar ice caps will stop melting planet. exactly yeah like that's not exactly how it works but that's sort of i think that it speaks to a mentality that i think used to be more popular i'm in my head right now just thought of like the polar ice caps are melting i was like quick everyone so i grabbing cigarette butts off the ground and all of a sudden the the iceberg just stops melting yeah exactly like and if we all believe like tinkerbell i mean in some ways pan is like tinkerbell and everyone stopped clapping except for a few people so he's just heard of a had a prolonged misery existence with one clapping hand i have no mouth but i must scream yeah basically (laughs) in some ways pan is just like you guys really messed up royally and i just can't even look at this planet anymore and i want to go it's funny because as we're reading this book series i've been getting rereading uh his dark materials and Mm -hmm. there's they tackle some of the same philosophies the core aspects i'm not going to really break down His Dark Materials, because I think it's a book that everyone should read. All three of them are fantastic, and they're making a new series based off of it. But it's the idea of, like, when when you're dealing with religion, I'm going to be very careful what I'm about to say, is that when you're dealing with religion, there's there's right ways to do things, and then there's wrong things. Whereas you have these people that are going to believe no matter what. Yeah. And even if the source doesn't want to, really does not want it, like... You you have this conception like you have like I, I guess the best example of this is like I always think of Daenerys saving all the people of um like she's the white savior but you have you have like you, they think they have this image of like you know Jesus is going to be break dancing is going to be shooting all the Romans like come in and save you sort of thing yes like well, yeah no, no, I, not necessarily like uh, coming in and saving you but like when we think of Jesus now sometimes you have the jokey thing like he's going to come in with like an AK forty seven. And shoot all like the Roman soldiers. Like he's like a kick ass person, but in reality, Jesus probably wasn't like that at all. Yeah, it was more like a a spiritual savior, not a a literal like a person who's going to come in and solve all your problems. Which I think is kind of what Pan is getting at, where he's like, "Listen, it's worse that you guys believe in me because it's sort of giving you an excuse to not believe in yourselves in a way. Like they're so focused on the cult of personality of like." that Pan will do everything for them, that they don't really actually enact maybe things that could be more helpful. If you want the core aspect of this is the person won't save you. It's the ideas that person passes on is what's going to save you. It's not the individual figure. I guess that's what is it like? It's almost like a martyr. You can kill the person, but you can't kill the idea. Yeah. And I think that's a very powerful message. I, I think that that's kind of... It's like such a heavy freaking message for a kid's book, honestly. This chapter's well, like again, well, very okay, metaphysical. Back, like, here we are again. Be, we're dissecting this book. We're getting rid of an ant hill with an atom bomb. Yeah. And I think hopefully people are finding this interesting. I, mean, like, I think this chapter is literally not just like subtextually, but textually very like philosophical. Like it's asking a lot of questions about like belief and action and that kind of thing. These are the chapters that I really enjoy in these books when you have a core theme that you're trying to explore, what may it be someone's morality, may it be the idea of not even just religion, but the idea of an idea, like good and evil. Like those are the things that I, personally on what I love, I don't care about like the romance stuff. I don't care about the action. The most relatable things that people can have is being people. How do you react to being human? Yeah. I mean, that's like a lot of like the, my favorite interactions. And in I mean, even the annoying stuff with Annabeth, I found compelling, you know, I like this chapter a lot because there was a lot of um, dissection about how like the different ways people hold on to an idea. Annabeth holds on to the idea of the way Luke used to be. Uh, Grover holds on to the idea of believing in Pan because he thinks that if he continues to live, that he'll somehow save them. But I mean, that's like, you know, if you love something, let them go kind of thing. And that's what happens with Grover, where he says, you know, I, what is the phrase that he says? Um, I've spent my whole life looking for you. Now I release you. Like it's, it's the kindest thing he could do in that moment is to realize it's more productive if he stops depending on this idealized version of Pan and what he could do for them and instead starts believing in what he himself can do. That's kind of the gist of it, I guess. If I wanted to bring up a movie, a good example of this, I think, kind of sums this up, is the movie Cliffhanger. Have you ever watched that movie, B? No. It's the one with Sylvester Stallone. He's a mountain climber. And I guess, spoiler for the first 30 seconds of the movie, he's climbing up with his, I think, girlfriend or his wife. Uh-huh. And all of a sudden, like, he starts to fall. His his wife also falls. And he's holding on to her. And they're both going to fall. So what she does is she cuts her, her rope. So she mm-hmm. purposely kills herself so he can survive. 
And he's he's guilty. He's like, I can't, I can't climb mountains anymore because of this. She had to let go, so both of them didn't die. One of them has to live. And I think that's a very important message even in, in this. Yeah. It's like, oh, I release you. By letting me die, we're going to let the satyrs and everyone else flourish. Though, I don't know how Grover is going to be like, hey, everyone, remember your god? Well, yeah, he's really dead. He's He died, and then, like, some weird smoke stuff came out and, like, flowed into everyone. But, like, sp- specifically, Grover, a little bit of extra. Hold on. I want to read um what oh, his message? said. Yeah. Well, not even the, I think uh, before that, I think we should read kind of... um what Pan says to everyone, because he gives him everyone a piece of advice, like the wizard from the Wizard of Oz. Oh, well, yeah, like what, what Percy says about how, like, it's not just about the satyrs, I thought was interesting. Um, Pan looked straight at me with his clear blue eyes, and I realized he wasn't just talking about satyrs. He meant half-bloods, too, and humans, everyone. Percy Jackson, the god, said, I know what you have seen today. I know your doubts, but I give you this news. When the time comes, you will not be f- ruled by fear. He turned to Annabeth, daughter of Athena. Your time is coming. You will play a great role, though it may not be the role you imagined. He looked at Tyson. Master Cyclops, do not despair. Heroes rarely live up to our expectations. But you, Tyson, your name shall live among the cyclopses for generations and miss rachel dare rachel flinched when he said her name he backed up like he she blacked up like she was guilty of something but pan only smiled he raised his hand in a blessing i know you believe you cannot make amends he said but you are just as important as your father i rachel rachel faltered a tear traced her cheek i know you don't believe this now pan said but look for opportunities they will come finally turn he turned back to grover my dear satyr pan said kindly will you carry my message oof oof now again, that brings back the mystery of Rachel Elizabeth there. Oh man! So this is le- adding to my theory that like her dad is a politician, <laughs> or something similar. Um, she is a a mortal, so I don't think that it's like any sort of magical being that her dad is. But he does say you are just as important as your father. And then that paired with some of the other weird stuff about her with the chauffeured car. I don't know. I feel like there's some sort of like major power that her family has i don't know what yet exactly they're either really rich or really powerful or some combination thereof or he does something inherently so good that she thinks i can't do anything like this like i can't cure cancer or i can't make breakthroughs in science yeah i'm not i'm not entirely sure it's interesting because the messages that pan gives to everybody reflects everything about them doesn't this feel very wizard of oz <laughs> Where it's like, and you, you've had courage the whole time. Really? What about you? Oh, I'm going to give you this heart. It's a clock. I, yeah. I'd like a real heart, please. And you, lion, here's a metal. Yeah. And the answer was within you all along. It feels very Wizard of Oz, this scene, honestly. And you know what, everybody? I'm going to hop in my hot air balloon and leave you guys. See ya. Also known as dying. <laughs> it's a metaphor for death. And oh, by the way, Dorothy, you had the power in you all along. You could have gone home anytime you wanted. You stupid I mean, idiot. that's like the lesson of all that that scene in Wizard of Oz. It's, it's similar here where he's like, oh, all of you, what you want. It's, it's within you. I believe in you. And then he's like, all right, can you let me die, please? <laughs> Basically. Grover, will you pass my message? What is it? Pull the plug. Yeah, basically. It's <laughs> it's really dark and weird. It's it's an incredibly cerebral episode or not, well, episode, yeah, but very cer- a cerebral chapter that I when I was reading I was like, "Oof, I was not quite picturing how much of a bummer this was going to be." It's great because with Rick Riordan, he shines when he does this type of stuff. He's goofy and fun, but he really knows how to do like his pathos and he knows how to do his ethos. Oh man, this this one really got me. It was a lot. Um I mean literally the, the last the ending lines are um Percy asks, "Are you okay?" I asked him. He looked older and sadder. He took his cap from Annabeth, brushed off the mud and stuck it firmly on his curly head. "We should go now," he said, "and tell them the great god Pan is dead." Like that's the that's it. That's the ending. Like, whoa, what that's so depressing. I think the best part about it though is that no one swings a sword in this entire chapter. It's true. No one does, and I it's better for it in a way. Yes, yeah, and you don't need that necessarily. And I think it's a very powerful chapter, and it's one of my favorites in all the series. Like, I was so excited to get to this one. It, you really delve into, like, the psyche of all the different characters and how they relate to each other. You, I mean, it's it's focused on Grover and Annabeth, but even just because Pan sort of talks to each one of them and how, you know, they'll 
feel in the future. Like each of the things that he says to them is like, so what could he even mean by some of those things? It's like very, I don't know, ominous or something like very cryptic. Some of the the things he says, like he literally says Tyson's name will be live on among Cyclopses for generations that Annabeth will play a role, though she won't know what it is. That per- The thing he says about Percy is bonkers. I know what you've seen today, I know your doubts, but I give you this news when the time comes, you will not be ruled by fear. Like, whoa, my dude. <laughs> what? <laughs> That's like an intense thing to be told by anybody, never mind an ancient god living in a cave. I think out of all of them, I think it's the most blatant with Percy, because if you look at the last chapter, there was something he was fearful about doing. Yeah, it's true. It's there's a, there's a lot of um, analysis of all the different characters that happen in this chapter, and it, it's stronger for it for sure. Like it's there's not a lot of action. It's all very like psychological. The the plot that happens here, and that's what makes this chapter great. Is you have the psychological aspect. People may not think of it really. I think we we talk about this like very you know thoroughly. But when you're reading this for a first time, you get like oh no, Pan's dead. That's it. But when you like sit down, and you really stew about it. It becomes a much more fast. I guess we're like we're like hype men at times. Yeah. We're like really hyping up this chapter, and that's okay. I am fine with that because this chapter is so mm, chef kiss. I really mm. liked it a lot. I I think it it did a lot of the things that other chapters in the past um, have done that I enjoyed. Like just really f- focused on the characters and less on like let's s- stab another monster. I guess like that is not very compelling to me, usually. And this chapter, I think, fully articulates what makes Percy Jackson great among YA and children's literature. Yeah, sometimes it surprises me with its um, with its depth, I guess. <laughs> so, B, what's the name of the next chapter? Uh, the next chapter is chapter 18, Grover Causes a Stampede. Oh, jeez. Oh, oh great. No, it's gonna be pandemonium. Hold on. This is giving me deja vu. Was there not a chapter called Something Something Causes a Stampede? No. Oh, no, oh, no I'm thinking of, um, it's Tyson, um, J- like, t- jailbreak. It has Tyson, a jailbreak. Yeah, it has a jailbreak. That has a similar energy to it, I guess. That's what I was thinking of. But, no, he causes a stampede of what? I do not know. Animals, I guess. Oh, no, B, is it going to be, they're going to, like, come out of the maze, and they're going to see Mufasa, and they're going to see little Simba? I, I honestly do not. No. There's wildebeest in the gorge. Long live the king. I'm. I have no idea what this is going to be. Like what animals? It could. I get the animals that can't have blood. I don't know. I uh, hopefully it's a stampede of penguins. I want to die by penguins or puppies. Puppy avalanche. That's how I want to go. Yeah. This is. I'm. I'm interested to see what happens. So like, just like the aftermath of them. You know. Yeah. Dealing with bad I think that, and now they have to go back to New York. I think what's gonna be interesting, B, is when Grover goes back to the Cloven Elders and he tells them, "Oh yeah, by the way, guys, uh, your God's dead." Yeah, do you think they're just gonna like burn him at the stake for heresy? Yeah, that's a pretty messed up thing to have to say, but you know, and no one's probably gonna believe him because no one videotaped this thing. I would have taken out my iPhone or something, you know, but unfortunately, that was not really. The technology of the time. B, you know you'd pull out your flip phone and you'd have like uh, 240 yeah, pixels. Yeah, it would be just like a, a single pixel. It'd be really dark. They'd be like, yeah, this is Pan. It's like, sure it is, buddy. <laughs> it's like this, they're going to like roll it like the Subruder film. I mean, I tried to film concerts on, on crappy cameras. Oh, Jesus. You were one of those people. later than this. I mean, when I was like 16 and they were like, oh, wow, look at that pixel is singing. Like, that's what a video of Pan would look like. Oh, you poor, poor, sweet summer child. So, B, you ready to read some emails? Yep. One from Brett who says, Hi, B and Zach. I really love your podcast. I'm on one of the last episodes of The Lightning Thief. I don't remember which. I love how Zach is like, I don't want to use the bingo board. This was my very first podcast. I look forward to the to mornings when I can look up and listen to you guys. One question is, I have is, what's your favorite animal? Mine is a hippo. Keep staying mortal. Ooh, man, this is this is hard, B. You want to go first? Because I gotta think about this. This is, this is big boy time right favorite now. Favorite animal? Um, I mean, dogs are good. So are cats, I guess. I'm like, those are like real basic. Do you mean, mean like an esoteric animal? I kind of love capybaras. They're really weird <laughs> giant guinea pigs. I love them. I love those videos of them sitting, like, in hot tubs with, like, the yuzu f- floating in them. It's very adorable. See, this is hard because 
can there be living animals? Because I love dinosaurs. Like, I love the T-Rex and I love raptors and Brachiosaurus. So do you love birds? Those are sort of like living dinosaurs. <laughs> do you really love an emu? I love the chicken. I'd, I, I'd eat an ostrich. Yeah. Chickens are good because they're cute and they're delicious. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> I was just about to say they're delicious fried, so we're on the same page. Uh, other things that I love is, obviously, I'm a dog person. I love dogs. I think I'll always dogs have a are dog. Great. Your dog is especially great, though I'm uh, skeptical that she's a dog. She's more of a Muppet. Well, she is. She actually came out of Jim Henson's brain. Her eyes look in two completely different directions. It's really amazing. She's like a chameleon. Mm-hmm. Yeah, she's got her eye on you no matter where you're standing in the room. She like looks at you, she can smell your fear and kibbles. It's true. So we got an email that says, Hi, Zach and B. Uh, here's a real long email and I'm not apologizing for it. And that's totally okay, Sabrina. I'm having so much fun listening to your podcast, Insightful Discussions about a series that is very special to me. My family and I moved from Mexico to Texas when I was 14 even though we weren't fluent in English already, my mom bought me and my siblings each a book to learn about more of the slang and idioms. And my brother recommended PGO. I remember I read chapter two of Sea Monsters and Tyson yelled, Percy Duck, <laughs> back when I didn't know what the word had a meaning other than a bird. You can imagine my confusion <laughs> as I was pondering how and why a winged animal would be relevant to a deadly dodgeball encounter against Canadians. I learned little things like that from reading the series and it really helped me uh, with translations into English, Spanish-speaking countries. So really, PJ has become who I am today. I, it's so exciting to be looking through it through a different perspective, including the negative ones, because the series isn't perfect. I thank you guys for venturing into the Half-Blood world and for all the good laughs on my commute to and from work. P.S. Barely on episode 39, and I can't wait to catch up and hear about B getting more and more immersed into the books and all the crazy things that happened in book four. Yeah, a god died. Bees lost their mind. <laughs> it's true. I didn't even remember what god it was because I guess I don't pay attention. I don't know. Thanks so much again, you guys, and keep horsing around, smiley face. <laughs> oh, that's a good sign off. I like that. I, I don't think we've ever gotten that one before, and that's great. I love that. Yeah, keep horsing around. That's a that's a good one. We should sign off today with that one. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm good. I we got to keep the formula or someone's going to... Well, you want to keep the brand? <laughs> we got to keep the brand. <laughs> we could keep staying mortal and keep horsing around. It's They're not mutually exclusive. Do we have any more emails, B? Uh, yeah, we got one from... We got one from Rachel. Oh, is it Rachel? Uh, yeah, I was about to no, say that. Rachel. Oh, no, we've been found out. They're like, it just... For some reason, you look at the email, you open it up, and for some reason, it's just a bunch of, like, magazine clippings of different, different letters. <laughs> yeah. Um... No, not from a serial killer. It's from Rachel, who says, Hi, I love your podcast. Once you finish, can you do the Heroes of Olympus? Um, who is your favorite god or goddess? Probably going to do Heroes of Olympus. We talked about this. And favorite god or goddess? Um, Honestly, Pan is pretty cool. That was a good chapter. And he has a lot of insightful things to say. He's pretty cool. Um, I also like Apollo just because he's a dum dumb. So that's kind of endearing. Ooh, for me, it is Athena, but the weird thing is, is like this new cycle. You, you know, this could sound really weird, but you can, if the, I might be an impersonator or not, but I think Ares is kind of growing on me a little bit. You think so? I mean, I haven't seen him in a while in the books, but. Well, it's thinking about no, him. No, I'm not a fan. I like Ares just a little bit. Is it because he reminds you of Clarice? No. <laughs> yes, yeah, I of... do not have a crush on Clarice. Well, no, I just mean like he has like that endearing sort of gruff quality to him, but he's it's worse than that. He's worse than Clarice. Well, no, he reminds me of the guy, maybe because I started watching, the guy that yells in his car, like super buff, and all he does is yell in his car, and I like him. Yeah. That's who I think about every time I think of Ares. An endearingly angry guy. Yeah. I, I can't relate to you, but more power to you. Well, it's either that or it's like, oh, you can have fan favorites like Hades or Zeus. No, thanks. It's it's interesting to see other perspectives, but it, it changes. Like every all my my perception of everything changes within the days. But thanks so much for that lovely email. Uh, do you have another one? I do, B. So we got one from Amelia. At school, I told five of my friends about. Um, at school, I told five of my friends about the podcast, and now four of them are binge listening to it. I've been listening since Sea of Monsters. On a totally unrelated note. I just imagine Half-Blood's running around Camp Half-Blood 
quoting the vines. <laughs> now I'll let you and your lovely imagination run wild with that. Your lovely listener, Amelia. I could really, for some reason, picture all of them like trying to travel across the country and Percy says road work ahead and then Tyson goes, I sure hope it does. Well, I think for for me, my favorite one would probably be back at it again at that Camp Half-Blood and the guy like does the flips. Does the flip and then break something <laughs> yes. and then you can see Mr. D like freaking out in the background. That'd be pretty good. B, have we ever talked about this on the show? What is your favorite vine? My favorite vine? Oh, there's... I mean, well, like, I mean, two bro- bros chilling in a hot tub is Two feet apart because they're not gay. And they were roommates. Oh, my God. They were roommates. <laughs> uh, my favorite one is the one where the person driving and you're hearing, Jesus, take the wheel. And the guy takes his hands off the wheel. And then Jesus and appears. Yes. Yeah. That was, that's a pretty good one. That one's good. Man, I miss Vine. I, I miss Vine a lot, too. Though, a lot of those people that did Vine now do YouTube, and I'm okay with that. So we got a couple iTunes reviews this week. Uh, the first one is from Solangelo Fan. Is that like a... It's a ship. A ship it's name? It's a ship. I think it's a ship name. Yeah. Uh, five stars. Love this. This podcast makes me laugh, and I hope they read Heroes of Olympus. Wow, people really want us to read Heroes of Olympus. I think we will. It's almost as if people really, really, really want us to read it. I feel like we got three messages just this week about how people want us to read Heroes of Olympus. So, yes, we read I'm not anyone that's into statistics, but I think uh, when you constantly have people asking for things. Yeah, I think we should just read Heroes of Olympus, I think. We might just rip that that bandage off. (laughs) Yeah. Because the problem, though, is we have to read it because then there's other book series that fall in line within that. are contextualized to that. Yeah, so we'll probably read them. So B, where can they find you? Uh, you can find me on Twitter and Instagram at B Kelly Gorman, and you can find me on Tumblr at twinpoetry.tumblr.com. If you want to find me, you can find me on Twitter at Suda41. That's S-U-D-A-4-1. Be warned, for the next like three years, I'm going to be playing Gears of War 5. So you're going to be seeing a lot of Gears of War 5 stuff. Uh, if you want to tweet at the show, you can tweet at us at, if you want to tweet at our show, it's at Halfblood underscore radio. If you want to email the show, you can email us at radiocamphalfblood at gmail.com. We have a Patreon, Patreon slash radiocamphalfblood, where you can get episodes early, a bonus content coming out very soon. We're still working on it. We have some a lot of content coming up, hopefully in the near future. Oh, there's stuff in the works, you guys. Huh. So many things. Playing schedules. <laughs> yeah, I feel like I should probably remind you guys about the meetup still happening. Um, hold on. I might just... I'm going to say the information right now in case you don't want to go and check my Twitter. Um, but it is the the pinned tweet. You can. You can go to my, my Twitter at B. Kelly Gorman and it's like the pinned tweet in that thread you can find the facebook event but just in case you want to know right now it's going to be on october 18th at 3 30 p.m at the william tecumseh sherman monument in new york city we are going to be hanging out there's maybe going to be some cool people there we'll probably have fun little merchy things to hand out first come first serve we'll see how many pins i can make it's sort of a testament to my abilities we'll see but <laughs> and the most important thing is that we've got a new shirt that we're going to be wearing and we cannot wait to show you guys our adorable shirts yeah we're going to be matchy matchy looking all uh camp half blood it's going to be a very fun time even if you're not going to the musical um you know, you, you, by all means, stop by, say hello, hang out. If you want to come and cosplay, go for it. Want to bring food? Go for it. Yeah, bring your um your Riptide sword, uh, wear your like centaur outfit, whatever you want. It's no holds barred. Heck, if you want to wear your dinosaur T Rex costume and we can recreate Jurassic Park, I'm down yeah, for no it. No judgment. No judgment. <laughs> I think that pretty much wraps up the show, P. Oh my god, this was great. This is a great episode. I'm happy that we we talked about this. I'm on cloud nine right now. (laughs) Well, guys, I'm Zach. I'm B. And let's keep staying mortal, and let's keep horsing around. (laughs) Both. You gotta do both. Bye, guys. See ya.